Welcome, everyone. I'm Bill Newell, and we are joined by Gary Wright, who is a retired hockey coach at AIC. We were classmates at the University of Vermont a number of years ago, a decade or two ago, maybe, Gary, right, uh, at UVM. Uh, Gary played college hockey, and he has a new book out. Well, it's been out for a little while, but uh, Striding Rough rough Ice, we have that uh, more information on that on our website and on this post. And uh, Gary, I wanted I want to talk about college hockey, but I got a chance. A couple of my friends sent me the sent me the links to the book. I ended up getting the book, reading it. And I was, uh, as I've told you, you know, offline here, there's so many connections, I think, of your experiences as a college hockey coach in uh, in New England as a player where, our, you know, we've uh, kind of had many of the same contacts over the years, especially, you know, as I do North Shore stuff here north of Boston, uh, many con you had many contacts on the North Shore with area hockey players and uh, coaches and so on. And uh, and our mutual friend, I think, is uh, Chris Wallace, who was my partner, yeah. uh, broadcasting partner at WRUV, the student station at UVM, an attorney out in Utica, New York. And uh, uh, I know Gary that he loved you. You know, he was a big fan of Gary Wright when we were in college. And uh, and to, and I'm a big fan of his. And so uh, and unfortunately, you know, I've tried to connect a couple of times because I've been out in that Utica area. Uh, but not in Utica as such in the last several years, but I just haven't been able to hook up with him, uh, though we do email from time to time and want to give a shout out to him. And of course, uh, note uh, the sad story of his wife, Martha, passing just recently. So, uh, Chris, obviously, the tie, I think, between the two of us, for sure. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so we want I wanted to mention that. But Gary, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. No, thanks for coming. And it's uh, even more intriguing to me that we've known each other for so long. So. I know, I know. It, it it it's amazing. The, the when I read the book, uh, and it was one of those things where I once I started it, it I had to do it all in one day. And uh, the names were names that I knew from Burlington, Vermont, where you played as a a UVM player, but also uh, you know later on coached and then went on to coaching college hockey. And uh, of course, growing up there in Burlington, college hockey was huge. It was the, it was the biggest thing in the state at that time. Uh, for sure. And I probably still is for the for the most part. But uh, Gary, why a book and why the title Striding Rough Ice? Well, uh, yeah, the, the title um, Striding Rough Ice uh, sort of comes from obviously the idea of, uh, you know, striding and going forward and stick to itiveness, you know, important qualities in uh, in life. And when you're facing any kind of adversity or that sort of thing. And then, and then the other piece of it was that I was in kind of the last played in the last of the outdoor era. Um, I think among, I think prep schools were still playing outdoors when most Massachusetts schools were playing inside, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. So the, the rough ice piece is taken from that, obviously, you know, I guess I suppose when you're, when you're trying to dribble a puck on the ice, it's like a quarterback trying to throw a wet ball or a golfer playing in the rain, um, so kind of those two areas is where I came up with the title. Yeah. Um, and, the other, and, oh, go ahead. No, and, and as far as writing the book then, yeah. Yeah, my uh, that in part, I had written um, a, a, a smaller project, a book for youth hockey coaches back in the early 90s called um, Pass the Biscuit. Um, some people probably originally thought it was a cooking book as opposed to a hockey book. But um, I had done that back in the in the early in the early nineties. I've always had an interest in writing, um, and a big part of it too was my mother, who has written over twenty books. She just died about a year and a half ago at, at roughly the same age as your mom, um, and she was always encouraging me, particularly the last couple of years that I was coaching. Um, she she wrote twenty books and and that, that were published, some fiction, few nonfiction, a lot of poetry, that sort of thing, and. She always said, you know, she had heard all my my coaching stories and playing stories, and maybe I ought to compile it into a book. So that's kind of how it happened. And, and that's I sort of took it from there. It was interesting because, you know, she sort of had to come into my world. So basically, she encouraged me to write the book and um, I would show her each chapter as I wrote it and, and get some feedback. And some of it was grammatical. She'd make a few other pointers. and But most of it was just sort of, you know, encouragement, that kind of thing. And so at the beginning there, 
you know, she, my father was a coach, so she had some familiarity with hockey, but, you know, she wasn't, you know, in the game per se. So she started to, I, I just got her to read like Ken Dryden's book, The Game of All Things. And, uh, and she came into my hockey world a little bit. And then I obviously entered her writing world. Um, and, it's, and that's how it sort of stemmed from there. And tell me about, tell our listeners about your dad's role in all of this too. That's, it's just, uh, you mentioned about playing outside and that's, those yeah. are some great stories of you growing up. And tell tell yeah. the folks just quickly that story, if you could. Sure, sure. And my mother also, when it was finally published, I think for all the books that she's ever published, it almost seemed like that was the most excited she had ever been yeah. even with her own. So I, yeah, I played for my father at Proctor Academy in Andover, New Hampshire. And I grew, we grew up. Um, our family we we had property that we owned in Vermont but we always stayed in um, faculty housing you know the 20 years that my parents were there so my father was the athletic director and he taught uh, history and economics and he was also the hockey coach so I grew up kind of as a faculty brat and a rink rat rink rat rather <laughs> and I eventually um, I eventually played for him and it was an interesting experience. And as I said, it was outdoors. So um, that was a whole different element. And occasionally, if the weather was really bad, they would reschedule a game at the, Con the Everett Arena in Concord, which was about 15 minutes away. Um, and then I ended up playing for him for a couple of years. And I remember one of the years he, my second year before the season, he said, well, you know, you're not going to be able to play with hair that long. This is back in the early seventies. Um, no. But when a couple of his top players came back with long hair, I guess he dropped that subject. Um, but it was interesting, you know, to, to, to play for my father and, and, and under those circumstances, I was very fortunate too, because he really loved the game and, and, and he loved the sport, but you know, it was only a part of his position at Proctor. And um now that I look back on it and see how some of these parents are these days, I feel very fortunate that, you know, my parents didn't live the sport vicariously, you know, through their son. And um, so that was a pretty positive thing. My mother used to go to some games and, and she would often uh, correct papers while she watched. <laughs> so your dad was Spencer Wright. Your mom is yep. Nancy Means Wright. So yep. I want to get those those two names out there. Yep. Um, the other thing is, Gary, you know, you and I are both at UVM at the same time, and I do not remember, you, you, you tell the story about how hard it was to make the UVM hockey team. And and I, um, and it's funny, as life is a blur, you know, I'm thinking Gary Wright was always hard crunching UVM hockey player, uh, but it wasn't the case. I mean, tell, I mean, you talk about perseverance, you and yourself as a, becoming a college hockey player is an amazing story, I think. Yeah, well, when I came out of Proctor, I mean, as I we you know, as I said, we played outside, so I guess I was somewhat of a big fish in a in a small pond, and I wasn't specifically recruited. Cross knew who I was, um, but I was certainly not a recruit. And, and interestingly, I went out for the team, and and hockey was you know a pretty big part of my life and pretty important to me. And um, I, yeah, I was kept around for about a week and a half, and and then I was cut, and I kind of figured that's it. I couldn't quite imagine, I guess to some extent, my hockey playing was tied into my identity or so I, I thought, but I got a break. I was, I planned to try out the next year, but you know, as I would learn through the years in coaching, if you're cut once, the odds of you coming back as a sophomore aren't real good. And they added a JV team uh, the next year, um, which was really fortuitous for my situation. So um, I started out with the JVs and then Willie McKinnon, who was a great player in November, got, got a, uh, uh, a separated shoulder and they brought me up, I, not to exactly take his place, but to be another forward. Um, so that year, and then I was sent back about two weeks later, I was sent back to the JVs. Um, and then the next year I was uh, just, I guess you could say Cross had cut me and then he decided to keep me because the next year, um, my junior year, I was with the varsity right from the beginning of the year. Although I did not get my junior year, I practiced every day, but didn't get any game time. And then as a senior, um, you know, I, I played, I was in the lineup pretty regularly. I, I wouldn't say I was in the regular rotation, 
you know, I was mostly a fourth line player. So it was a little bit of a long road. Um, and, and I did write about at one time, my, my senior year, um, this is back when St. Louis had a team and they, um, the two days before or the day before, whatever it was, when crossed announced a lineup, I was skating regularly on the fourth line. I figured I'm in pretty good shape to dress for my first game. And he inserted somebody else and I was left off the dress list. So I called my parents and, and talked to my mother and said, I don't think I can do this anymore. You know, this has been four years of this and I don't know if he's going to play me. I think only if, there, if he absolutely has to. Um, but yeah, I, anyhow, long story short, I was back at practice on Monday. And, and from then on, you know, I never had a healthy scratch again that year. Um, so, yeah. But and I think at the same point, it was very advantageous to me because ironically, I didn't necessarily realize at this at the time that even though Jim Cross, my, my coach, wasn't playing me, he always thought I might be coaching material. And exactly. so, yeah, so my first coaching job at Rice High School, which you're very familiar with, and then um, at the University of Maine, that was almost all cross. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with that because for our listeners, um, Jim Cross was a coaching legend in Vermont at the time. Uh, he yeah. had taken a program from a Division II program to a Division II, one program, contending, uh, ECAC um, success and, and all of that. And that, like, I, that's what I just wanted to follow up with you on because Cross saw something in you, but yet it sounds to me like there wasn't a lot of dialogue between the two of you over the years. Does that sound right? You know what I'm saying? And that can happen, but he did believe in you. Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue. Like, like in this day and age, even for the last 30 years, you know, when I was coaching, you know, you met with players individually, like scheduled meetings at least three or four times a year, you know. There wasn't a whole lot of that. I mean, he was always a, a very good communicator, yeah. but there wasn't a whole lot of hand, and there wasn't a whole lot of communication in that area. I, I do remember, and I wrote about it, um, my senior year, we were playing um, Clarkson at home. And Cross used to stand on the bench at that time, whereas now, you you know, in warm-ups. And I came over to change sticks, and he said, Gary, you're, you're, you're really doing a great job there. Keep it going. And, you know, I think I use the analogy of, of Mark Twain when he said he could, you know, go two months on a, on a good compliment. Um, so those kind of things, you know, when he did say something like that, it was certainly encouraging. But... Um, but I always had a lot of respect for him. And, and obviously, you know, he wouldn't have pushed me towards, you know, I never would have got that rice job and yeah. I never would have got the main job for sure. Those two to begin with. So I guess in that respect, you know, I, I made a career out of, of hanging in there barely at the college level, you know, that, that sort of jump started my coaching career. As an assistant coach from Maine on to AIC, but I'm, I can probably get back to that, but I just want to talk, have you talk a bit about the North Shore connections here for our, for one of our audiences here would be the North Shore connection here. So yep. we're talking about uh, North of Boston, Saugus, you know, uh, Peabody, Salem, Beverly, and so on. And you, you had a bunch of connections. I mean, when I was reading the book, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I know a lot of these guys. I mean, when I first started uh, working for WESX in Salem, Saugus, Chris Serena was actually an assistant coach at the time at Saugus High School yep. for a year or so then. Yep. Then he became head coach, then on to Merrimack. His players, who you recruited, some of them at AIC, but then um, uh, you uh, worked with Gary Kahn when he was at Maine, a Marblehead guy. You played with Tom Colby uh, from Marblehead. A lot of North Shore connection. I know I'm missing out. I think there's a Beverly connection or two. Plus, Mike Gilligan, when I moved down to Salem, you know, I used to have this joke, not a good joke, by the way, that I helped him get the UVM job <laughs> up at Vermont, which I had nothing to do with, I, you know, obviously, but uh, but we, I would kid him when I'd see him once in a while after that, but uh, because coming from Vermont and then he just, when I, as soon as I got down there, boom, he took over for Jim Cross when he retired, I think pretty much soon after that. But uh, anyways, I mean, there's the, I, again, I was struck by so many connections there. Yeah, no. And, 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 you know, guys that were teammates and, and obviously guys that I coached. I mean, yeah, Tom Colby was a was a teammate of mine at the University of Vermont. Very good player, um, especially I think he, he sort of, you know, emerged at, into like a you know 20 goal scorer as a senior. And he played, I think, for the infamous Bud Men for years and years, which had a okay. lot of former former college players. 
Um, and then Chris Serino was an AIC grad, and he's one of the yeah. few pure three sport athletes that ever came out of the school. He's in the Hall of Fame there. He played baseball, football, and hockey. And um, I'm pretty sure as a quarterback in football and baseball was his best sport. And then he went on. I, I actually, I didn't know him then, but I, when I was playing for Mills and Greer softball in Burlington, we used to travel around the East. And um, anyhow, I ended up playing with, against him a few times. And um, so he, and then, and then what, what happened with that is. Can I, can so, I interrupt you for a second here? Cause sure. back, back in Burlington, you were playing for Mills and Greer, which is a championship team. I played for modern septic. So you were crushing the ball over the fences at the time, yeah. but just so you know that, folks, while I was trying to ding singles down the right and left field line here and there in games. But anyways, yeah, you were crushing it in softball uh, in, uh, in that league up in Burlington, Vermont. But go ahead. I interrupted you. Well, you, you played for one of the, uh, the better names for a sponsor, Modern Septic Systems. Yeah, Modern it's, Septic Tank System. MSCS. Tank system, whatever yep. it was. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure the, what was modern back then isn't quite so modern now. You know, we played a long time ago. They were they were involved with the old portalettes. You know, they, yeah. they're still around today. <laughs> yeah. You know, haven't That's changed funny. much. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, so so Chris Serino, you know, who was at Saugus, and then he was at Northfield Mount Hermon. He was an assistant UNH. He was a head coach at at uh, Merrimack. Um, he uh, he coached a number of players obviously and one of the, the best players he ever coached there at Saugus was Kevin Workman and yeah. he came up and, and visited our campus one and, and would bring some of his players up you know he, he, he was very loyal to his alma mater which was really nice but anyhow Kevin Workman was one of the few guys that I ever had drafted he was drafted by Calgary and he was player of the year in the ECAC we were this before we went division one um, and was really just an, an exceptional player. And his, his father was a fisherman up there on the North Shore. And he, his sister, it was kind of ironic, but his sister was an RA on the, on the, and was ahead of him at AIC. And she told me one time, you know, I've got a, this is a couple, this is when he was only like a freshman or sophomore. I'd never heard of him. And she said, you know, I've got a younger brother and he's a pretty good player and you might want to look at him. Of course, everybody's got a younger brother or a cousin or a neighbor that's a pretty good player. And that's not always the case. But anyhow, he came and, and then uh, Don Massini and Jeff Painilini about that same time. And uh, as I said, Kevin was a was a was a great player. He's even player of the year and went on and played about five games with the Calgary Flames. Sadly, he died really prematurely about four, three or four years ago. Um, mm. Just kind of unexpected. He was only in his 50s, otherwise in pretty good shape. Um, but he was a special player. And, and the fact that he was, you know, played for Chris Serino and AIC grad really, really helped us. Um, Gary Kahn coached him at Maine. I was an assistant coach. Yeah. He was on the line with John Tortorella, you know, the NHL coach. Um, he was an All-American at Maine, Gary was, he was kind of an average skater, but he wasn't average about anything else. You know, his compete, his toughness, his ability to see the ice, his goal scoring was exceptional and, and he was coachable. Um, and he was just a, a an exceptional player at Maine and, and he's in their hall of fame now as Kevin Workman is in AICs. So yeah. those are a couple of guys and there's, there's, my I, I, I don't want to mean is there's a, there's a number of them anyhow. Well, I, I'll stop there. But I, Gary and I worked in the Lynn Public Schools together at the same time a number of years ago, and he we were at different schools, but we were in the same building at one stretch for a few years there. Um, I want to I want to circle back before we run out of time to go back to my days at WRUV with Chris Wallace, uh, my broadcasting partner, which <laughs> put us into the book, which brought us our, our incredible at first ever fame, I think, for that for that, but. Uh, Tell us that you know what. What did you hear about these broadcasts, these hockey broadcasts that, that got us that got this these mentions in your book? Well, I'll I'll lead into it, and then I'll let you take it take take a little fair, bit from fair, there. Fair enough. Fair no, enough. No, yeah. I was always so we had a commercial station, you know that 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 uh, that, that covered UVM hockey, um, and then we had the student station which covered UVM hockey, and you and Chris Wallace were broadcast partners. And what I what I wrote about in the book, which I just have always forever been amused by, in part because 
you know, I grew up in a tiny town in New Hampshire, and then we spent summers in this really small town in Vermont, and I'm still here now, we're back here now. And you guys ran that fictitious farm report, like for five minutes between games. So all these, all these people who are listening to a game think this is a legit thing. And, and you and Wally, I guess, are both playing parts in this. And, 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 and I guess I'm assuming that quite a few of those people never realize that this isn't two, you know, old time Vermonters speaking, but the two broadcasters themselves change, you know, switching into, into uh, Vermont accents and taking it from there. So I did, I did. And, and I also, I understand you guys also did in 76, you did an election report too. Yeah, know, right. I, I forgot that votes one. And we got three votes in Milton, but I'll let you, but it, I, I wrote about it because it's just, just classic, you know, and very much something students would do. Right. Yeah. It, you know, uh, I, I remember uh, we were down in Boston the year before the, our senior year and uh, yeah. UVM was down at the Boston, the old Boston garden. And um, let me just click one thing off here on my screen here. And so UVM loses in the opening night. And so now they're in the consolation game Saturday. I want to, I want to say it was at the garden. And so uh, we were staying down at a friend's a friend of mine's uh, place down in the Boston area. Uh, Cause we were college students. We needed a place to stay. Right. And uh, so the second night we decided to come up with these interviews. Oh, that's what it was. We were doing these Vermont voices, my friend and myself uh, and my friend, Tim Hall, and uh, we said, well, let's do this. Let's do an interview between periods, send it back. So now we're broadcasting back from Boston Garden to Burlington there. And uh, we do these fake interviews. Uh, and uh, they're all different things, you know, whether it be a guy coming down from Vermont in his camper, watching these games at UVM, because it was a huge thing back in Vermont in the day. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I had a friend that we did, uh, he did a, uh, he he pretended to be a philosophy professor at UVM uh, between periods. Uh, you know, you have these guests on and, uh, but Wally loved it. And then Wally was doing it himself, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, our senior year. And so what we did is we did, a, I guess what it was now, it's coming back to me. We did a serious interview between one period and then we did one of these yeah. other interviews between the other, between periods two and three or whatever it was. But uh, it kept, uh, it kept us going, you know, kept <laughs> Well, Wally still has a fascination with Vermont. Yeah. And about four years ago, I got a text from him saying, I live in Cornwall, which is right next to Middlebury. And it's, I don't know, maybe it's 1,500 people. I'm not, maybe it's up to 2,000. I don't know. But he texts me and he said, I thought you might like to know your covered bridge in town is on fire this very minute. And he's four <laughs> hours away. <laughs> He was on the UVM site following the soccer. You know what I'm saying? It goes on to get a score. Yeah. And sees that information. And it was true. So I found out before most people in town from a guy four hours away who doesn't miss much, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and the other thing you you meant, you said too, um, Bill, which I think is, and you said it at the outset too, and, and because we both, you know, spent so much time back in Vermont in that era, but, but you know, it's it was almost like, UVM hockey to the state of Vermont was almost like Nebraska, Nebraska football to the state right. of Nebraska, but ours is toned down a little bit. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, it, it's been through the years, and particularly in that area, a pretty big deal. You know? No, it has. I mean, it's and it's funny. You were you were um, in as far as your coaching college coaching jobs. Uh, I mean, well, you were in Burlington as a player at UVM, which is which is which got statewide coverage. And then went to Maine. And at that time, Maine hockey was the yeah. same deal in Maine, to be honest same with you. Thing. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. you know, now there's some other teams in the Portland area, I guess, you know, different things. Uh, but yeah. but in the day, Maine was Maine was the big deal. It was that was that was it. And for a time after that. So you were there just before Sean Walsh arrived, yeah. another legendary yeah. name. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a very so much a parallel. You're absolutely right. Very much a parallel to the two. And they both went from Division two to one. They both made the jump. And in and, and both instances, they became sort of a pretty big deal in a small state. Yeah, and when I when I came down to Boston, I had the chance, like I said, to do Harvard hockey, Boston College hockey. And yet, you know, you don't, they never, you know, the bean pot was huge. Back then, even the bean pot was much bigger then than it is today. Uh, but, uh, but it still wasn't the same because you always had the Bruins and Celtics in the wintertime dominating 
dominating the winter sports coverage and not that then that's the way it would be I mean, there's no doubt about it but but the other thing i want to get to gary as you mentioned uh college hockey uh well, I, obviously that's what it's all about but there is such a um there it, it, there is such a connection among college hockey coaches and players that you know it, down in this area people may not really realize that as much as there i mean but it's it's um like there would be in college football or college basketball and so on it it's a real it's a it's not a niche thing but it, it's it's intense the college hockey you know following the, the followship if you will the people that follow it yeah you're talking about in terms of fans and coaches knowing each fans other. Fans and coaches knowing each other or a network. Yeah, it's it's a tight network, I guess, is where I'm trying yeah. to go with that. Yeah. yeah. It's somebody said, you know, it's it's um, you know, hockey has its own niche, but it's it's still a very big niche, you know. And and part of the reason that I wrote the book, I I think is, you know, there were so many people in the hockey community, whether it was my players, coaches sports writers, fans, administrators that touch my life along the way. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's just, a, just always been a, a really, you know, really great community in general. Um, yeah, I've been a lot and there's a lot of great people in it too. It still are, you know, and so on. So um, Gary, I'm looking at my clock here. We have a, we definitely have a few minutes left, but what else would you like to share with us? I mean, I've kind of dominated these with a handful of questions here and topics, but what else would you want to share with us about the book or, or anything else that, uh, that you think is important? Well, I mean, it was, a, it, the writing experience alone was a wonderful, was a wonderful experience. I initially, I never thought I could even sit this long, you know, or <laughs> sit this long and write a book. Um, so that was pretty, you know, pretty fascinating to me. It brought me, I probably interviewed, I don't know, 50, 60 people that, you know, either played for me or against me or whatever the case. Um, and I try to, you know, part of my, I mean, I really love college hockey, you know, and um, I think the fact that it's in a sense, it's an extension of the, of the uh, classroom and it's, and it's, it's, it's ultimately administered by educators. Um, it's just a wonderful, and, and it, it's a little bit more regional, but, but more national now. And, um, I, I, you know, I'm, it's, it's just a path that I took that, you know, when I was a little kid, I loved the sport and I, and, I, and I'm so glad, um, that I did. So, um, it's just been, a, it's been, it's just been a great experience and, and even, you know, running, you know, even the fact that you and I are sort of sitting somewhat opposite, you know, each other on zoom here, um, is, is pretty special even in itself. So, yeah. Yeah, and it and it is unique. And again, I I I mentioned this at the very beginning, but I was just struck by all the different names that are in the book that you know that I knew, whether it be Joe yeah. Britannia, um, Bernie Saplicki, the Rice basketball coach. Yeah. Who, uh, I I took driver's ed at Rice in the summer. I didn't go to. <laughs> I went to Burlington High, but I didn't. You know. And then your connection. I mean, you share the stories about coaching high school hockey in Vermont as well for a few years. You did, did a nice yeah. job there with Rice and you know, help that program along quite a bit. And, uh, but you're right. I mean, all this, uh, and, and the travel too. I, th that's another thing I wanted to talk to you about. I, I think we have a minute or two left here, but when you're a college hockey coach, there's a lot of, there's scouting. There's a lot of driving around New England yeah. in the winter time. Back in those days, there was a lot of winter driving. Now yeah. kids are playing year round, I guess. But uh, in that, back in, back in the day, if you will, uh, you had to travel the state, uh, quite a bit in the winter time, didn't you? Or the New England area, rather, I should say. Yeah, I mean, you're, yeah, back, you know, there's not, there's still a lot of travel. But yeah. also with all the internet, you can watch a lot of kids and, and and then obviously there's more summer things, that kind of thing. But the travel is, you sort of have to like the road, you know? <laughs> you may not be quite a truck driver, but in some respects, there's a lot of commonality. And that is a big piece, you know? And I got to a point where like, I can't navigate myself that way around Boston, but if you tell me, you know, can you go down and, you know, visit these five rinks, I could probably get there without a map. But, um, but yeah, I, that, that whole travel component and, and, and just getting out on the road and, and, you know, sometimes getting out of practice at four o'clock and then you've got to go watch a game in Boston. And um, with my assistants and I, we used to some one sometimes, you know, if it was a Wednesday or Saturday when the prep schools are playing too, yeah. we would almost map out a thing. You go to this game and that game, and maybe we'll yeah. meet at the last game. 
Um, so yeah, that's that that was a very big part of it, and still is maybe not quite maybe not quite as much, but a pretty fascinating part of it as as well. I had an assistant who who rated all the all the snack bars at all these rinks. You know, exactly. We right. go to the Everett Arena because they had chocolate pucks and Loring Arena because they had curly fries, whatever it was. But um, yeah, and meeting coaches and 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 you know, you and I ran into each other. It was either late late eighties or early nineties. I, I know. Asking a game, and I was watching a game. Oh man, I know, Gary. On this, my time is running out here. I'm going to stop the recording. But Gary, thanks so much for joining us. Congrats on the book, and we'll put everything up here on the post here. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.